All right, a few weeks before we uh, recorded this episode, my guest Ira Cohen and I wrote this uh, well-received post on uh, time series, specifically uh, uh, trends and opportunities. So time series broadly uh, defined, which includes the analytics, the data management, and the uh, use of AI and machine learning. So in this episode, I have Ira here with me, and we will talk about uh, some of the uh, uh, challenges that uh, we surfaced in the post. And uh, for our listeners, I will link to the uh, uh, original post in the episode notes. So uh, my guest today is my co-author and collaborator, Ira Cohen, co-founder and chief data scientist at Anadot. And let me just read their description. On their website, uh, they monitor 100% of your business data in real time, so you can proactively resolve revenue, cost, and customer experience issues before they impact your business. But uh, for this episode, we'll talk mostly about time series in general. So, Ira Cohen, welcome back to the Data Exchange Podcast. Thank you, Ben. Great to be here. And... Uh, Full disclosure, I'm an advisor to Anadon. So, all right. And uh, let's go through some of these uh, opportunities that uh, opportunities and challenges that we listed. And uh, part of the motivation for listing these opportunities is uh, for any of our listeners who have an itch to scratch, we are giving you ideas for uh, uh, what you might uh, want to work on. So the first thing we surfaced is uh, modeling tools for streaming data. In our post, we listed a bunch of tools and open source projects that have uh, arisen in recent years that have made it easier for data teams to uh, 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 do modeling for time series. But almost all of those, in fact, all, I think all of them uh, ta target kind of batch related tasks where you have the data and then you develop a model and then you apply it. Uh, whereas I think my my prediction is next year we'll have another resurgence in streaming data for a variety of reasons that I won't go in, through here. Uh, but it seemed to us that the time series and streaming are kind of a, a match made in heaven. You know, because most streaming data have a timestamp. But then the tools for modeling streaming data are still uh, kind of uh, lagging. So, Ira, any thoughts on this I, this topic of uh, time series for streaming data? Yeah, so so there are, the, I mean, it's not, uh, um, it, it sounds very simple, uh, uh, presumably to what's the difference between the streaming data and the batch data paradigm. I think where, where things become complicated is when you try to do uh, on the streaming data, compute various statistics that sometimes require batch data or more natural for batch data. Even counting the number of unique users on a website, uh, coming to a website in the last uh, hour, um, if you want to do it on streaming data with no memory, it's actually a bit challenging because it's not a it's not a linear uh, function. So a lot of streaming analytics tools have to think about the edge cases of of uncommon st statistics that do not fit well with streaming data. Um, think about cases of of late late arrival of data. How do you fix data? How do you fix your analytics? Uh, even though you are sitting on a stream of data and some data may arrive you know much later or out of order a lot of uh, a lot of challenges in those uh, areas which would be great to have tools that solve them solve them reliably so Ira, uh since you you and anadot uh, basically help a lot of companies with their time series problems so is is this an imaginary problem on our part? By that I mean, uh, are are there increasingly situations where people have uh, time series arriving in a streaming fashion, and they want their forecast to get refreshed? Um, no, it's not. Uh, we're not dreaming. It's actually happening in a lot of companies. 
for forecasting, for anomaly detection, uh, especially short-term forecasting. If you're talking about longer-term forecasting, like forecasting next year, yeah, the streaming data is not that yeah, critical. Yeah, yeah. For that. You yeah. don't need to update it all the time. But if you're forecasting things that are short-term, like in the next hour or next 24 hours, those definitely become uh, require streaming data. And there are use cases like that, in, in especially in companies that... Uh, that have to do demand, supply demand in, in short amounts of time, take a ride sharing company. Um, they, they want to forecast the future, the near future, so they can make sure they have you know, enough drivers on the road um, and, and you know, incentivize to all sorts of things based on those forecasts. So definitely there is a need for, for streaming data. So right now, uh, if you don't mind the sharing, so, uh, what are some of the workarounds for people who need to do this in the absence of open source tools, for example? So what are people doing? Um, they're basically, I mean, there are there are some streaming, uh, streaming mechanisms like Kafka and Kinesis where you can do basics and basic analytics. Yeah. I think most of the time what people built on top of that are, are, are tasks that are, I would call the mini batches. Right. So they would collect some amount of data and then and then run an algorithm on that mini batch. Um, but that's uh, that, that's that's okay, but it doesn't scale as much as, uh, as and also and, 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 and also I I, I guess uh, as you describe it, the people are doing it on their own bespoke, right? So there's nothing yeah. that the data teams can take off the shelf and start using themselves. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, it's not uh, it's not that easily available, um, and and some platforms solve some of the problems, but not all of them. None of them that I know of solve all the problems. All right. So the next thing we surface. So so again, uh, before I go actually to the next thing. So people who are uh, looking for things to work on. So that's one thing already that you can work on, which is basically analytics and ML and uh, or statistical models for streaming data, streaming time series data. All right, second uh, challenge we raised, which is might be counterintuitive to some people because we live in the age of big data, is that uh, there are many situations still in time series where you have insufficient data. So, um, yeah. and, and, uh, in our post, we brought up the possibility of synthetic data generators because I personally have spoken to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in the synthetic data generation space. And while we associate them with computer vision, they have increasingly told me that uh, more and more people are turning to them for structured data and mainly time series. So, Ira, talk about insufficient data, how... how uh, common is this and uh, and talk to us about synthetic data yeah so so it's extremely common and 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 because at the end of the day let's say you're trying to forecast uh, your revenue of a product in a certain country uh, in the coming weeks what the strongest signal that you have is the sales of that product and and the history is always limited. I mean, you, and even if you had 10 years of history, let's say you're looking at data daily, then you have 365 points a year. If you were talking about data, even hourly, then multiply that by 24. It's still not a lot per year. And even if you had a long history, probably a lot of it is not so relevant because the world is changing. So you end up actually looking only at the last year, two, three, in, in a lot of cases of historical data, and even at high granularity, hourly granularity, that's not a lot of data points. And that's what you have to learn from. So, so in, and, you, and you need to split it to a training set and validation set and a test set. Uh, so you end up actually not having a lot of data points per time series that you're trying to do something on. So the synthetic the synthetic data generation uh, one of the uh, I mean there are a few ways to to try to tackle this problem. Um, 
One of them is using transfer learning, basically learn on other time series or learn on, on a lot of time series that have, each one has limited history, but by, by joining them into one data set, you might be able to, to gain some patterns that they all share in common, and then you can apply it on a new uh, time series. Uh, and another approach is synthetic data. Oh, so before, synthetic before you data, go into which... before you go into synthetic yeah. data, so let's stay stay with the uh, modeling. So so you have transfer learning, mm -hmm. which implies machine mm -hmm. learning, but yep. machine learning, in as you point out, is kind of a data hungry uh, approach. Specifically, when you start using neural models, deep learning, right? So right. Uh, what about so? Is there any uh, uh, advantage to in these situations sticking with classic statistical models that are less data hungry. Uh, yes, a lot of times, and you can see it in competitions and uh, in forecasting competitions um, that happen every few years. Uh, you see the stack classical statistical models like uh, ARIMA and um, triple exponential smoothing. Uh, and all sorts of variations, and even XGBoost uh, is actually very, very powerful as well. They tend to work as well, if not better, on certain tasks than the, than the deep learning architectures uh, with you know, a fraction of the training time, a, a small fraction of the training time. And that's really the reason. It's because uh, uh, deep, I mean, neural networks are, uh, are data, very data hungry. Uh, while these other uh, simpler models are not as data hungry. But even the simpler models require some amount of data before you can really, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they do, but they, they, tend to rec they tend to overfit a bit less uh, than the uh, deep learning uh, models. Okay, so now synthetic data. Yeah, so with synthetic data, so, so there are various challenges with, with even the approach of taking a lot of data that you do have, let's say you take a lot of time series that you do have and you train one single uh, model on them. The problem with that is that uh, this real data, it's very heterogeneous from our experience uh, in its behavior. So a lot of different time series behave differently. This is not like speech where speech is speech or vision is vision. The world is the world. Here, you're measuring all sorts of things, and they tend to behave in all sorts of varying ways. And we've seen at least 10 or 12 different kind of categories, but there are actually a lot more. And if you try to learn, if you grab all of those uh, from somewhere and stick them into and try to train one large network, it actually has a hard time. Uh, uh, because of this heterogeneity, it cannot, it, it doesn't learn well because it gets confused by the varying behaviors of the different time series. If you use synthetic data, you can actually control what time you control, what are you generating, what, what type of behaviors you're generating, and you can train based on that. And you know, if you, if you look in the literature, there are a lot of uh, variables to describe the behavior of a time series from seasonality to to uh, stationarity and 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 probably 20 or 30 different parameters that basically will define how a time series will behave uh, and if you can actually create a, a generator a data generator that will allow you to control these parameters you can decide you can figure out i probably have data of a certain type let me generate a lot of it using the synthetic generator and data generator and now i can train a much bigger model but there's a lot of uh, uh it's not something you would have a lot of confidence right off the bat right so you would no. let's say you would go let's let's use the synthetic data generator build a forecasting model uh don't deploy it but kind of Test it offline, and then exactly it it will, and then even then you don't know if at some point there's some change in the world if this thing can keep up, right? Right, and you have to you have to keep track of that. Otherwise, it it won't you won't keep up. Yeah, it won't keep up for sure. You have to keep track of it and then adapt, change it to the changes in the world. Uh, it's it's right, right, right. So. I uh, haven't seen what functioning well yet. Uh, yeah. We've done some experiments. Um, so in theory, it should work. 
uh, in reality, I haven't seen it work yet in 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 a good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, and by the way, yeah. So one thing that uh, we uh, I don't know if we made a distinction in the post. So we talk about time series, but in this space, people make the distinction distinction between metrics, which are time series that arrive at a regular basis, and events, mm -hmm. which kind of are much more sporadic and unpredictable. Right. So. Right. Uh, yeah, a lot of these tools focus on metrics, right? Yeah, yeah. Events, events tend to at least what what we see in kind of in the more business world of time series, right? So time series that we collect from from companies about revenues and users and things of that sort. Uh, at least for those type of time series, uh, the events are are typically you don't try to forecast the events. Uh, the events are usually things that you know about in advance, uh, like product release, like a sale event, like uh, and then they are sporadic in nature. I mean, they're a lot more sparse than than so they're even though they they're time stamped, they're not a time series uh, in that sense. And but they are very powerful to help forecast those time series, those metrics. Uh, because they they actually a lot of times these events things happen during those events that are important for the forecast. Just take I mean Black Friday this week, right? So Black Friday is a day that changes the sales of a lot of companies. If you don't forecast that day well, you might be off for the whole year by quite a lot. So let's let's uh, close the loop on synthetic data. So in your mind, where are we? And uh, what we what, what kind of uh, what hope are you holding out? So so the hope is that really we can that there can be a synthetic data generator that is general uh, that can generate time series of ver varying behaviors uh, similar to how it is out there in the world, and then we can really train. I mean, the hope is. We can train this one or multiple big uh, uh, neural networks with lots of layers that can capture a lot of the dynamics that there are in time series uh, without us having to engineer the features for them, like we have to do for XGBoost or other types of models. And then they can they can those models can be really be used to forecast almost any time series as long as you are aware from what domain it came from, what is the underlying nature of the behavior of it. Um, so if I'm looking at uh, EEG, it will have a certain type of behaviors. If I'm looking at business data, it will have other types of behavior. Uh, so I expect a model for different domains. And, and then basically you might have, you might want to, to adapt it to a particular thing that you're trying to forecast, but your starting point will be so good that kind of even when you have no history, kind of a cold start problem. This is this is the dream. So that give me something that you're starting to measure right now or starting to act on right now, right? I release a new game or a new product. I don't know the revenues I'm going to get for it. Uh, so it's a cold start problem in terms of forecasting that metric. And if those models can forecast that fairly accurately, that is really a huge advantage. Because today, so, you're basically in the beginning guessing. So a couple of things, and uh, I want to get your take. The first one is uh, um, usage of synthetic data. Maybe uh, maybe we need to uh, kind of dial back on how we use it in the sense that maybe it's great for testing. Maybe, you know, not, not necessarily, right? So testing the uh, robustness of your model, right? So, so number one. Number two, um, when we think of synthetic data, uh, when people talk about and write about synthetic data, we have this notion that it's a singular thing, that it's an answer. I Here's a time series, I generate some synthetic data for that time series, and that synthetic data is the answer. But in reality, might it be better to think of it in terms of a simulation tool? So in other words, you know, I mean, I generate a bunch of synthetic data and then I do some kind of, uh, it's almost like Monte Carlo simulation, you know? Um, uh, it's not yeah. a, in other words, I don't, 
expect to generate the one universal, uh, one synthetic data time series for my time series, and that's the right one, right? So. Um, you probably, I mean, because of the, all the parameters of that, that describe the behavior of time series, and there are you know many of them. Yeah, you you won't get one. You you'd have to simulate a lot of different things, and then you know. And then you'd have you'd have process. a prediction with error bars or yes. whatever, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is this something that uh, uh, is is some? But uh, is this something uh, that you think uh, will work? Theoretically, I think it should work. Uh, but if you, if you know been, if you know the underlying distribution of the time series, yeah, exactly. But the practice <laughs> is—I mean, I've been surprised by the real data so many times that it's. Uh, yeah, if, it's if you know the data generating process, which, by the way, then you don't know—you don't need even need the synthetic data generator. Right? <laughs> so this is the pro This is the thing with uh, this. Uh, it's one thing to use it, for example, in computer vision to try to see if a vision system will will break down. Right. So, but when you're using it to do things like forecasting, it's a bit, it's a bit harder, right? It's a bit harder, but I do believe it, 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 it can be achieved. It's just, it will be harder to prove out. And I think probably the, the easiest way is to focus on a certain domain where you do have a lot of examples of real time series. So you can compare and, and make sure that you're on the right track. Um, but it's not as simple as as in computer vision because the again because people when people a lot of the literature talks about time series it talks about certain types of behaviors like stationarity but there's so many other things that happens in the real world where you really see them and and observe them part of that some of them you know it's All right. So the next uh, the next topic is multivariate time series. Um, and uh, so here, what what uh, we pointed out is a lot of the tools are focused on univariate time series. So Ira, uh, talk to us about multivariate time series first. Kind of give a high level definition and and uh, tell us why it's a lot more challenging and why. High level definition, why it's important and why it's challenging. Yeah, so so multivariate time series analysis basically means you're taking and you're analyzing uh, multiple time series in one model as as as, a, as an entity. Um, and in general, a lot of times you might want to do that because it can capture the relationship between the variables that you're measuring, between the different time series that you're measuring. And, and by capturing it together, you get a more accurate forecasting model, more accurate anomaly detection, depends what you want to do with it. Um, the, the challenges with that is that uh, now, I mean, if before we were talking about forecasting a single time series, um, now you're looking at a whole group of time series, and each one of those may have may have a very different behavior, underlying behavior that might require. I mean, if you looked at it by itself, you would say, okay, this one needs model A, and this one needs model B, which might be a completely different type of model. But now I put them together. Now I have to model them jointly, and I'm, I just complicated the the problem even more. So. Uh, the heterogeneity of the behaviors of, of when you look at multiple time series, that can screw up the modeling quite significantly. If they're homogeneous, by the way, then it's easier. Then, then you know that a certain type of model is the best fit for all of them, and you would use that. Uh, so that's one uh, one reason why it's hard. So so uh, reason so yeah. if so if I'm uh, listening to this and you tell me, okay, so multivariate time series is harder. And mm -hmm. by the way, uh, there's fewer tools uh, mm -hmm. to do multivariate time series. Then I'll say, well, I'll just try to get by with univariate. 
And that's what uh, you, most of the time you you, you do. Um, I think where it, uh, but you lose something out of it. I mean, you, you definitely lose the, the dependencies that you have between these time series that you're not capturing. And, you know, if you're talking about forecasting, you might be forecasting less optimally because you're not jointly modeling uh, multiple, multiple variables. Um, so there is a power for more more variables, but it comes at this uh, increase uh, increased risk that you're actually going to screw it up, uh, and you get less tools to use it for. Um, by the way, the second challenge is is the fact that a lot of times what you measure, if you're taking measurements from about different things, let's say I'm measuring revenue and I'm measuring errors in an application. You know, revenues may be, I may be, it may be available to me every hour, and the errors may be available to me every five minutes. So they're not, sometimes they're not even on the same time scale. And now I have to do something to, to align them because most, well, not most, all the models that I know of uh, for multivariate time series analysis assume that your variables are measured at the same intervals of time. Uh, and if they're not, you have to do something about it, uh, pre-process it. Uh, and there are techniques for doing it, but it adds another layer of complexity. And uh, that's the difference between academia and the real world. The real world is normally 80% of the time you're working on the data. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so one of the things we point out is uh, in, in interest in auto ML for time series. And we put up a, a, a graphic here, which shows, you know, if you're just interested in data scientists and ML engineers and deep learning engineers, that's one set of users. Okay, so maybe some of these tools now that appeal to Python data science teams or ML teams uh, are enough. But the reality is time series uh, is everywhere in most businesses. And there's a lot of potential users. They could know how to program. So for example, they could be developers or engineers, or they may not have programming skills. They could be analysts, but really, really know the data well, the domain and the quirks of the data, the seasonality and all of the things that ERA points out. So we, we try to make the case that uh, um, there's a huge opportunity for any amount of automation or simplification or democratization of time series. And I point out to a an effort at Amazon, which took a decade, and that team is massive, by the way. I don't know exactly the headcount, but that, there's a lot of people. So you have a big team. They have expertise in time series. Uh, they have access to many types of time series, and then it took them a decade to get towards this unified uh, forecasting model that uses some ideas from uh, deep learning. And the other example I point out is you guys uh, era at, at uh, Anadot, which you guys now have this autonomous forecasting tool. So talk to us about the challenges of automating or simplifying uh, or making time series modeling accessible to non-experts. Right. So basically, there are two parts of this, of the auto ML. One part is the obvious one where you want to both uh, uh, do hyperparameter tuning of different models and also select between different models. So it's not, uh, or, or combine different types of models. Um, because as I said, I don't think there is, at least today, a single model that rules them all. Um, so automating all that process of hyperparameter tuning for all sorts of different algorithms um, is important because if you don't, then the the analyst will have to do it or somebody will have to do it, and they will have to be they will have to then be proficient in you know in what is Arima, what is uh, Garch. What is, XGBoost, what is this? What is that? I mean, it's all sorts of different models, guards, all sorts of different models that they would have to be proficient if they want to do it themselves. So that's hard already. Uh, and, and, and these are models from all sorts of domains. It's not like all of it is neural networks. No, neural networks, just one um, or 
you know, could be multiple variations of, of neural networks. Uh, and even then, each one might require an expertise. So you want to you want to automate that part, uh, so the user doesn't have to do it. Uh, and the other aspect that you want to automate, which is as important, is the data preparation for each type of model. So each type of model requires a different data preparation. So you have your time series that you want to forecast or or, or model, uh, and you might have additional uh, information, additional time series. It might be multivariate in some cases. To prepare the date, to prepare a time series so XGBoost can use it requires one set of preparation. To prepare it for something like uh, um, LSTM requires another preparation. Each one has a different data preparation requirement before it can even run. So again, if you now want to use all of them and we believe that you need to run through all of them, because you don't know a priori which one would be the best, then you'd have to implement all these different uh, data preparation um, mechanisms for each one of these algorithms. And that's, again, that's not trivial. But then, uh, but then uh, as the way you describe it, I can take someone who's uh, somewhat familiar with the underlying business problem. Mm -hmm. And if I put a, the right UX on top of it, they might be able to do some of a lot of these tasks, right? Because uh, the data preparation, for example, for XGBoost, you need to take your time series and transform it into features that XGBoost will take in as input. And you have to decide on those features. And that's not necessarily a domain expert that will know how to do it. You really need a data scientist to do it. So <laughs> So that's if that's not automated for the analyst, they wouldn't know how to do it in most cases that I am aware of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what I'm saying is, uh, if 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 you can take you can put kind of like a no code user interface on top yes. of some of these tasks, and and uh, you would get a long ways with some with an analyst who actually understands the underlying uh, business yes. data, right? Yes. Yes, that's true. And that's the AutoML part. That, that's where AutoML allows you to have a simple UX for that analyst. Right, 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 right. And so then uh, uh, at some point, my my dream scenario, my science fiction scenario era is uh, a, de a simple declarative interface, right? So which is basically, here's my time series. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I want. I want to forecast seven periods in advance. Now go do your thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how far uh, away are we from this nirvana? No, I mean, for the basically, our product is what that's what it does. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, will it work for anything, any time series, anywhere in the world? Probably not. But it'll anything. get, it also gets better as you use it more, right? Definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, all right. So then the next uh, uh, topic on our list is uh, kind of th this notion of scale. So here I can talk this through a little bit. So there's this notion of, uh, I guess uh, some people call it partitioned models, right? So think of scenarios where you want to train a time series model for different sensors, right? So uh different uh, cars, different phones, different appliances, whatever your sensor might be. And yep. you might have to do that at scale. So many, many devices. Um, so uh, yeah, so how do, how do we do? Uh, so it's one thing to train the same model on each of these, but another level of complexity is you may want to train multiple models for each of your sensors and maybe pick the best one or create an ensemble. So even mm -hmm. much more complicated kind of scenario. So uh, the good thing is we have kind of these frameworks like the open source project Ray, uh, which will allow you to do this. And people are doing this for time series using Ray. Um, but uh, it's not yet something that, for example, the time series libraries uh, a lot uh, enable you to do. They they tend to let you. They tend to ha uh, have you train uh, a model 
each time or multiple models each time on yep. on for the same kind of problem but uh, i think there might be i don't know so do you see use cases for this kind of partition model uh, era are you starting to hear about kind of uh, people wanting to train a lot more specific models for uh, a device or a situation a scenario no, I, I haven't. I think it because it's fairly early days for all these, uh, you know, training models for sensors. I think most of the time when people think about that in terms of scale, they, they think more around the, you know, putting the ML on the edge. So putting it at the or sensor. Just, or just uh, train the same model and push it out to the edge. Instead exactly. Of, okay. instead, instead of training an individualized model, right? Exactly. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so that's, that's what's most of what's done today. I haven't heard because in the, in the, kind of in the world that we are in, the, the more business world, there are, it's less about the sensors. It's more about you know measuring measurements of what's happening in the business. Um, but like you said, you get you have cars, you have devices with five G, lots of more devices that are measuring constantly, and you do want to have something more. Uh, um, yeah, you can imagine even uh, more uh, on wind, each one. windmills or base towers of, of, <laughs> of mobile phone providers, right, and so on and so forth. Yeah, or, they wanna, they wanna, they want to forecast. I mean, mobile phone providers a lot of times want to forecast uh, what will happen on each. Uh, um, what will happen? What will be the congestion of traffic as it moves along uh, a geographical area? And high granularity, and that requires a lot of sensors, basically grabbing data from each antenna and and doing on each antenna what's happening to it, and then combining it. So it gets it gets very complicated, um, uh, but it's it's still early days for that. I think it's not, it, I think whoever comes up with something that can do this uh, paralyzed paralyzation uh, for for trillions of sensors. Um, Probably in five years, it will be a big thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Now, and the then... thing that people are doing today that that uh, kind of helps train a lot of models uh, um, um, for individual sensors is doing it sequentially, doing the training sequentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of doing batch training, basically training as the data flows in, and then you don't have to keep memory. Disadvantage of that is that you don't get, I mean, in batch in batch training, a lot of times you you get to see the entire history and you can do all sorts of modifications based on based on going back and forth on the data. When you do sequential, you can't go back to the to what happened before. You 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 keep going, and so so you might have less accuracy that way. Right, 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 right. And then we close our list with a couple of items. Uh, focus most mainly on data infrastructure and uh, and tools for time series. So one of the things that I, I kind of uh, thought about for a while is the notion of specialized time series databases. And they're super popular. Anyone mm -hmm. who reads Hacker News uh, will see a, a post that make it to the front page about uh, time series databases. And they're great. Um, and they're databases, so you have to kind of understand what your workload is. Workload will be: is it going to be mostly OLAP analytics, or is it OLTP and transactions, and so on and so forth? But you know, uh, data teams and platform teams they want to simplify their stack. So if they can get by with fewer uh, tools to maintain, they'll do that. So one of the questions, open questions that we didn't really answer in our post is uh, at some point will, so at least for OLAP or analytics type of workloads, will some of the existing tools like uh, some of these OLAP stores or uh, lake houses, will they be good enough to uh, do so take over some of that work? And the jury's out. It It depends on how much resources those tools put into improving their time series capabilities. But uh, I'm sure if they improve, uh, they may get to the point where uh, teams might think, you know what, we need one less tool, right? Yeah, I mean, I generally agree. platform teams uh, want simpler things. Um, 
And then uh, one, the other thing that uh, I threw out there is uh, vector databases, because they're, you know, we live in a world of embeddings. Embeddings are kind of like the lingua franca of uh, AI. Uh, so for text, for example, vector databases are quite popular because they're great for vector search, semantic search. Image databases are starting to use them. But one of the uh, tasks that Ira and I listed in our post is uh, uh, mining massive amounts of time series, right? So uh, by mining, you can imagine data mining, but applied to collections of time series. So clustering, this kind of thing, search. Uh, so might vector databases play a role there? I don't know. So do you have any yeah. thoughts on vector databases? For time series? Yeah. Um no, it's exactly what you said. It's still uh Yeah, it's hard it's hard to say. So how do you vectorize the entire time series or do you vectorize windows of it, right? So kind of like so in yeah. speech in, in in audio data, right? So you uh, when people uh, have played around with some of these things, you know, it's um, why would you vectorize the entire podcast episode, right? So you probably vectorize windows, right? Thanks. Yeah. 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 So and same here, thing with here, same thing with time series, probably, right? <clears throat> I mean, if the time series are um, of certain types, uh, let's say they are, I wouldn't say stationary, but they are amenable. They're they're at least regularly measured. Um, you you could vectorize a time series by taking a Fourier transform, for example, or a wavelet transform of a time series. And fixing the amount of coefficients that you that that come to describe it, and then store that, and presumably you can restore the original time series from this uh, representation. You can restore it completely while maintaining it at fixed uh, length. Of course, in all these techniques, uh, basically this is like I don't want to call it embedding, but in a way it's uh, you know, transforming a time series into something that is fixed length. Um, that can be recovered directly from it, then it might fit there. But there are a lot of challenges with you know using techniques from signal processing like Fourier transform or wavelets, and there are a few other techniques in respect to um, what what might happen with real time series. I know that, for example, our times our type of time series uh, that really relate to revenues and users playing and stuff like that. Uh, if we try to represent them with a uh, Fourier transform coefficients, the reconstruction will be pretty poor um, because of their unique behavior. So it will it can be good for some time series. That's one way of thinking of it as fitting it into a vector database. So let's uh, close uh, era by having you kind of uh, just tell us a. Uh... Looking ahead to 2023, are there particular areas in AI and machine learning that you're excited about monit monitoring or thinking of uh, of uh, kind of applying applying to Anadot or 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 some of the things that Anadot is doing? So, looking ahead to 2023, what what's on your plate? So so for us. I mean, there's a lot of things going in AI that are super exciting, especially around vision and the whole uh, uh, generating data, uh, vision data or audio data or text data. I think that's super exciting. It has nothing to do with Anadot, though. Um, on our plate are things like the cold start problem, like the single model uh, problem, trying to to see how we can we create uh, mechanisms that will be able to Will be for will be able to forecast something with no history uh, or very little history. That's the cold start problem, and the single model problem actually aligns with that as well. Um, so that's that's really in terms of machine learning, that's the uh, main things that are on our plate. And you, your your target users are not necessarily coders, right? So so you're trying right. to you're trying to make time series. Uh, uh, Easy for them. Advanced time series techniques available to people yeah. at the front lines. Exactly. And and we try to not even call it, uh, I mean, we try to call it by the thing that they're trying to solve. 
instead of uh, by the machine learning terms or by the right. uh, um, kind of the data science -y way of thinking of it. Right, right, right. And with that, thank you, Ira. Thank you, Ben.